when it comes to data analysis, a ton of emphasis is put specifically on the data itself being accurate, and that's obviously pretty understandable. There are a lot of ways that you can make mistakes that influence your findings when it comes to harvesting data, so it's really, really important that we understand how to get good data, and how to identify data that's sketchy, shaky, or outright inaccurate. A bunch of my previous videos have approached data analysis through this lens in the context of Overwatch, whether it's talking about the importance of accounting for survivorship bias in your data, or how hard it can be to sift through a mountain of feedback to find the useful pieces of data to actually work with. And I do think those videos still hold merit, it's still useful to look at data analysis through that lens. However, there is a problem with putting too much emphasis on the data and not enough on the analysis, and that it's that people sometimes assume that good data will inevitably yield good insights, or even that the data is the only real vulnerable link in the chain. Of course, if that was the case, it'd be really, really easy to get better at a game like Overwatch, where we eliminate a lot of the problems that human error introduces to data collection formulas. I mean, we're offloading all that responsibility to the program itself. There isn't a risk of a human being failing to account for some of the shots you take when calculating your accuracy, or two different people trying to collect data about accuracy but disagreeing about whether or not scoped and unscoped accuracy should be fully calculated separately on heroes who use them, or any number of other issues. The system is programmed to apply these standards consistently and fairly to make the data pretty good by itself. And yet, if you've ever opened up your career profile and tried to use that data to actually learn something, you've hopefully realized that it actually isn't that simple. It's not just about the data being good, it's how you use it. And in this video, we're going to talk about why people learn the wrong lessons from good data. Part 1. Conclusions Before Data one of the really obvious reasons why this can happen is that people start with a conclusion in mind and then just sort for the data that affirms that conclusion. In Overwatch, the most common version of this is someone who's on the losing team and is looking for someone to blame for why they aren't winning. So they open up the scoreboard and see what they can find. Is the enemy team's DPS doing better than your DPS? Well, then it's a DPS diff. That is, unless you're the DPS, in which case you're not going to draw that conclusion. Instead, what you're going to do is see how the supports match up, and hey, maybe your supports are dead way more often than the enemy team's supports, so support diff. In this situation, the data isn't inherently bad, and it is definitely reflecting a weaker performance from your supports than the other teams. But you're not going to learn the correct lessons from it, because you failed to acknowledge data that contradicts the outcome you want to be proven, and you don't want to dig deeper in case you find something you don't like. You know, maybe your supports did die more and do less healing, but maybe it's not because they're just bar for bar worse than the other team's supports. Maybe the actual problem is that their tank was better positioned throughout the match to protect their supports, giving them more freedom to maneuver. Maybe your DPS weren't falling back to defend the supports when the enemy team was diving them. Or maybe they weren't diving the enemy team's supports aggressively enough to kind of keep it even. Maybe the supports are the problem, but then what kind of problem are they? Is it their accuracy? Their positioning? Their resource management? Honestly, it's part of why support diff and tank diff and DPS diff are such good trash talk lines. They aren't just insulting someone's performance, they are deliberately oversimplifying the problem. If you've ever played your heart out on tank, for example, and gotten absolutely zero help from your supports and DPS, and the enemy team's tank says tank dip in the match chat at the end, you're going to be pissed, because you know it's not that simple. Even if the data in the scoreboard is objective, neutral, and accurate, you know it's not telling the full story. The goal of data analysis isn't just to have numbers to look at and, you know, scry them like tea leaves to see what you can find, it's to see if the numbers are actually telling us something. In this scenario, we want to know what went wrong. And while the scoreboard might provide good data that can point us in the right direction, it isn't the full story. Now, to be clear, this isn't the same thing as starting with a hypothesis and working to check it. Generally, when you conduct a study or do research that involves collecting data, you start with a hypothesis that you want to test. Let's say you wanted to do a study about how people handle a rolling stop, and you want to see if there's a variable that maybe affects that. So, you'd start with something like, My hypothesis is that there is a correlation between the model of vehicle someone is driving and how likely they are to perform a rolling stop at an intersection. You're looking for a relationship between two variables, the model of the vehicle and whether or not they perform a rolling stop in an intersection versus stopping for the full time like they should. You'd want to define terms like rolling stop as something specific like any instance where a vehicle approaches a stop sign and does not come to a complete stop for three seconds before proceeding. And you would also want to determine how you count people who are forced to stop because other cars have the right of way. You know, maybe they would have done a rolling stop, but there's a semi in the way, so kinda gotta just stop regardless. So, to check your hypothesis, you might sit at the intersection for a day, record the results, and come to the conclusion that people who drive Ford vehicles are the most likely to perform a rolling stop, while Hyundai drivers are the least likely. However, you still need to control for as many variables as possible. Maybe you need to check other intersections, or run it on multiple days, or even try to run it in other communities. Maybe you need to check it throughout the year, since people will drive differently when there's ice in the winter. And even still, does it tell us something definitive about why someone does that? Even if we conduct this study perfectly and it still shows that Ford drivers are the most likely to perform a rolling stop, what actions are we wanting to take here? 
Are the people who perform rolling stops more likely to buy a Ford for a related reason? Is there something we can like teach people when they go to buy a Ford to stop them from doing it? Is Ford deliberately manufacturing vehicles that are optimized for rolling stops? If not, is there like a manufacturing change they need to be making here? Even if we establish a correlation between Ford drivers and rolling stops, or if we establish a correlation between you losing your games and your supports getting diffed, are we learning a useful lesson? I mean, sure, we might use that data to get pissed at our supports for not doing enough to help us, and sure, we might use that data to assume anyone driving a Ford is a shittier driver relative to everyone else, and especially Hyundai drivers, but is that the right lesson to learn from that data? Frankly, is there any lesson to learn from that data? One of the difficult things to come to terms with in data analysis is that sometimes their conclusions aren't really actionable. Maybe the reason you lost truly was a support diff, but what can you do about it? You can try and think of ways to compensate for your supports in the future, but the scoreboard itself isn't going to tell you what went wrong to that extent. And if you're just solo queuing, it's not like you're going to be with those same people again so you can apply those lessons. Trying to internalize a lesson where there is nothing valuable to learn is learning the wrong lesson from data, even if that data is good. When evaluating data for something to learn, you can't come into it with a predetermined conclusion, and you can't come into it with the expectation that you will inevitably be able to learn something from it. Frankly, part of why research is so time-consuming is that you have to spend a lot of time double, triple, quadruple checking your work to make sure you aren't just chasing ghosts, or chasing the conclusion you want to find. Not to mention checking it for bias. Like, who's conducting the study on which drivers perform rolling stops? Where is that funding coming from? Is it a neutral researcher? Or is it Hyundai trying to get some data that they can turn around and publish to say, Hey, look, the data says people who drive our cars are better drivers than everyone else. But if you see a Ford at an intersection, maybe play it safe. By doing so, they aren't just trashing Ford or promoting their own company, they are deliberately trying to push people to buy a Hyundai because it comes with the reputation of being a better driver, even if there's nothing about driving a Hyundai that makes someone a better driver. It's like how an electric vehicle comes with the reputation that you care more about the environment on average than someone driving a gas guzzler. Like, we all know that electric vehicles are very expensive and aren't going to work for everyone, and yet, there's still a connotation that people who drive EVs, at least to some extent, care about the environment. And that can actually help us demonstrate why this is so tricky to navigate. Maybe you live in a place where environmentalism is really important to people, and that's reflected in a bunch of different ways. You know, maybe the Green Party gets elected where you live, and maybe electric vehicles are more popular. However, maybe you live somewhere where the oil field is really important to people, and where electric vehicles aren't seen the same way. Or maybe you live in a place where environmentalism is really important to people, but people are kind of poor in that area, and they can't afford those vehicles. If you're watching Overwatch content creators who try and tell you that tanks or DPS or supports as a whole are overpowered, or even just individual heroes, are they telling you this neutrally? Are they biased in their perspective? After all, if someone's an on a one trick, they are obviously going to have a stake in arguing for Kiriko being nerfed out of viability. And they'll also be trying to pull in anyone else who's frustrated about Kiriko to put pressure on the devs. They might even be going out to look for data that confirms their feeling about this, or not even data, just anecdotal evidence of people being pissed about Kiriko being able to do XYZ. But it's important to address at this point that doesn't mean they're inherently wrong about Kiriko. A bias doesn't mean that every conclusion you draw is fundamentally flawed, just that those conclusions are coming from someone who has an external motivation that might be influencing them. If someone stands to gain from people learning a specific lesson from the data, it's always important to be critical about it and avoid buying into it just because someone with a big platform said it. Again, I talked about this in the last video in terms of why being high ranked doesn't mean you magically have a game design degree, but part of the reason why it's important to listen to people beyond just the top 500 is that a game dev's priority is going to be a lot more neutral than people whose entire livelihoods depend specifically on being good at the game, while the priority for the top 500 player is going to be to ensure that the state of balance is one they can thrive in. I mean, they won't say that for the most part, they don't want to say that they're just talking about whatever balance change keeps them in the top 500, but they're not going to advocate for a change that's going to make everything worse for them. They still want to be at the top, and obviously, if they got to the top 500 under the current state of the game, they're going to have a bias in favor of something that maintains the status quo to some extent. However, what happens when you're trying to measure something that isn't as easy to quantify? Part 2. Unmeasurable Performance in the examples so far, I've tried to keep the focus on data that can be quantifiably measured in some way. Like, a bullet either hits a target or it doesn't, and there's a way to objectively establish that. However, what about performance metrics that aren't as easy to measure? If the supports on your team include Mercy and Lucio, then damage boosts and speed boosts are suddenly in play, and measuring their impact is way harder. Like, if you look at the scoreboard and you see a Mercy and a Lucio with lower healing than mirrors on the other team, you might infer that they were performing worse. However, is that actually true? Can we say that definitively from that data? The other Mercy and Lucio might have just been healbotting, and if you know anything about either of those heroes, you know that nobody who's good at them would play that way. Damage boost is a hard stat to track in terms of the impact it has, since it's not a direct impact ability. You might be damage boosting the right target in theory, but if they're missing their shots, you're not going to end up having the impact as a consequence of them. This is a real challenge facing researchers when they have to try and prove a causal relationship between variables where one is clearly having an impact on the other, but they can't make the direct connection between them. Sure, we all know that a good Mercy is going to be hitting the damage boost and helping you secure kills, but how do we objectively measure whether that's happening or not? 
How do we tell if she's doing it at the right times, the right moments? Even if two mercies have the same damage boost uptime, that doesn't tell us anything about whether they use it equally effectively or anything else. And yet, we know that damage boost is useful. If we're being honest, it's so useful that it is constantly a problem for this game's balance because it makes it way, way harder to finely tune any hero's damage when there's someone who can come along and crank it up another 30%. In the real world, this kind of thing happens a lot when you try to measure for stuff like social variables in a relationship. For example, we know that race and gender are both variables that have a relationship with income. The data on that is clear. We know that a white man is going to earn, on average, more than a black woman. However, we need to establish why that is if we're trying to learn what we can do to actually fix that problem. And that can be really, really hard to do because there are a lot of indirect impacts happening and not a lot of direct ones. A lot of the ways in which race or gender will impact your income levels are incredibly indirect. Like, okay. How do you measure for someone who had a racist teacher for a year who didn't treat them fairly so their performance in school dipped? And then it made them dislike school so they didn't put in as much effort as someone who didn't experience that. And that eventually led to them having worse grades when it came to college applications so they didn't get into a good school. Or maybe didn't get into any school. What happens if two people apply with identical resumes for a job in game design where one of them is a man and the other is a woman, and the interviewer chooses to hire the man? Whenever you talk about this, there's always someone who gets mad and says like, Oh, are you saying they should never hire the man? And the answer is that that's not inherently a problem. The fact that it happens once isn't an issue, because a decision obviously has to be made. The problem is that this sort of thing is going to happen multiple times, and if the man is being picked over the woman at a far higher rate than you'd assume given a 50-50 split and exactly identical resumes, then you have issues. The question then is how many times does it have to happen before it counts as a usable statistic in terms of learning why there's a gender pay gap and what we can do about it. The reason it matters is that it's really easy to learn the wrong lessons when dealing with this kind of data, is that we can fix it by providing more STEM scholarships to women in order to encourage them to get qualifications that bring them up to an even playing field with men. But what happens if the problem is that men and women with equal qualifications are not being hired at equal rates? The problem wouldn't be a lack of qualified women, it'd be the biases in hiring practices. I mean, there might also be a problem with fewer women choosing to go into STEM because they're not being hired at a fair rate, but solving that problem without solving the biases and hiring practices issue means that you're just trying to throw more women at a gender pay gap instead of addressing the reason why it exists. To bring it back to Overwatch, the problem might not be that your team has a Mercy who wasn't healing enough or that she should have swapped to a different hero. Maybe the problem was that you should have hit your shots when she was boosting you since she can't have her maximum impact without you doing your job properly. Lucio is even more complicated because there's no real way to even begin objectively measuring the impact of speed boost. We can measure how much time he's spent speed boosting people, or how many people he's speed boosted over the course of the match, but what does that actually tell us? Was he doing it at the right times? Was he being useful with it? Like, even if we could draw a clear, objective, definitive line in the sand between good Lucio speed boosting and bad Lucio speed boosting, the question is still how you would quantify speed boosting in order to put someone on one side or the other. Without being able to do that, all of Lucio's stats become that much harder to learn anything from. Not just his speed boosting stats. Like, is his healing low because he's constantly out of position, or is it low because he's coming in with those clutch speed boosts? If his healing is high, is it because he's doing a good job of knowing when to swap songs, or is it because he's not speed boosting when he should be? With a hero like Widowmaker, we know she's not meant to be doing as much damage as Farah is, so we can calculate her performance accordingly. But what do we do when a hero's kit isn't able to provide clear data that allows us to evaluate them like that? Then again, if we want to learn a lesson from our data, it helps to remind ourselves of another big issue. Part 3. Narrow Data and Broad Lessons Let's say you're playing an Overwatch hero with pretty significant spread like Sombra. Now, you might spray and pray your machine pistol into the whole crowd of the enemy team for the full 60 bullets, and you might land every shot you fire so the system records it at 100% accuracy. However, it's not really reflecting accuracy, is it? I mean, sure, it's literally reflecting the percentage of bullets that hit a target, but that's not really the same thing as hitting the target you're aiming at, or even having a specific target in general. When you're collecting data like this, you can't differentiate in terms of whether or not there was a skill shot, or whether the shots were effective, only whether or not they connected with a valid target. If I fight a Roadhog and land 60% of my shots, and only land 30% of my shots when I fight a Tracer, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to recognize that it's because the target size has dramatically shifted, and to recognize that the changing circumstances also change the outcome you're trying to achieve. If I have 25% accuracy against a Roadhog at close range, I need to call an optometrist after he sends me back to spawn. However, if I have 25% accuracy against Tracer at close range, I'm putting serious pressure on her, likely forcing out a recall if not getting the kill. Beyond that, what happens if you're not really trying to land every shot? Like, you can have an impact on the game without landing a shot. There are other ways for a bullet to affect someone. An obvious example is Junkrat. You don't need to land a direct hit with every bomb to have an impact, and spamming it through a choke point might still have the effect of forcing the other team to turn around and find a different route. You hit 0% of your shots in that situation, but you have the intended effect on the enemy team, and you were able to do so without having to risk yourself or anyone else taking damage because the enemy team couldn't even look around the corner. If the enemy team has a Sombra and you do some quick spy checks for her, you'll likely miss every shot. You're trying to shoot someone who's invisible after all. 
But if you can hit even one that exposes Sombra while she's out of position, all those missed shots were worth it, even if the accuracy stat would reflect that you did a pretty shit job. Both elements of this combine for a hero like a Hanzo, who might spam arrows through a choke or around a corner in hopes of pressuring the enemy team. And he might get a critical hit that instantly kills an enemy despite never seeing them. If you've got a Hanzo on your team who's spamming those shots constantly and landing at least one of them at the start of every fight, his accuracy might look like shit, but the only lesson he can learn from it is that this is working. The point of this is that even in a situation where data is being measured about as objectively as possible, you need to remember to never overstate the meaning of that data. Calling it an accuracy stat is already kinda overstating what it's doing. Accuracy implies that you hit what you were aiming for, not that you just hit anything at all. If you're aiming for one person and you accidentally hit another for chip damage that doesn't do anything, is that an accurate shot? Because the game will count it as an accurate shot, but is that actually accurate? On top of that, does it change if it isn't inconsequential damage? What if you're playing Widow and you try to headshot one target but accidentally catch someone else and kill them? Is that accuracy? Again, the stats will say it is, but if we're trying to learn a lesson, is that data helpful? Not really. It's good data, it's accurate data, the system hasn't failed to account for what's happening, but accidentally succeeding at a task you weren't trying to complete isn't the same thing as being able to deliberately succeed at something you were trying to do. And if you're trying to learn lessons from your data, you need to be able to account for those things. You might go back and review a VOD from a game where you had a 50% accuracy rate on Cassidy, only to discover that you were just feeding that damage into a road dog's belly when he was being pocketed while missing every single shot on flankers who were melting your team. Data is, in a lot of cases, very narrowly applicable by itself. The data from the firing range might tell you how good you are at hitting targets in a controlled environment with no danger and nowhere for someone to hide, but is that data applicable if you're someone who gets easily panicked in-game? Your stats can tell you how many shots you're missing versus how many you're hitting, but it can't tell you why. You need to see how other variables are affecting that data. Maybe your aim is better on some maps than others, so the lesson is that you need to try and become more familiar with them, or maybe they're just not good maps for you on the hero you're trying to run there. Maybe your aim is pretty consistent across all maps, but it tanks when you're on defense as opposed to attack. So the lesson is to try and figure out what it is about defending that makes you fuck up your shots. Maybe you're panicking, maybe you just aren't good at holding a position, maybe you don't know how to fight when the enemy is approaching you and you're not approaching them. Your accuracy stat can't tell you that alone, and any lesson you try and learn based solely on that accuracy stat will be a shot in the dark. If your problem is coordination, an aim trainer might help. But if the problem is that you panic, then it won't do anything for you to shoot targets in that controlled environment. If anything, it might make it worse if you only practice in stress-free situations. And again, it's important to emphasize sometimes there is not a lesson to learn. Sometimes the data is good data, it's accurate data, but it just isn't telling us very much. In a situation like Overwatch where there are so many variables at play and very few of them can be controlled for, it's not enough to just look at a single match, either in terms of your performance or anyone else's, if you want to actually learn and improve. This is why people say there's not a substitute for just playing a ton of the game. You won't be able to contextualize that data and learn lessons from your performance without a lot of experience with it. There are so many variables at play in terms of maps, characters, game modes, team compositions, and more, that you could easily play a thousand games before you start to really get a grasp for what your stats are telling you, especially because new heroes and new maps are always being added. And even then, unless you're analyzing them correctly and effectively, you won't be able to learn the lessons you need to learn to get better. Frankly, a major reason why people learn the wrong lessons from good data is that they assume the data is trying to help them get better, that it's trying to tell them something. And that's just not true. The data doesn't actually give a shit about trying to help you get better. The game isn't telling you your accuracy so you can learn something from it, it's just giving you those numbers so you know what happened. It takes conscious, careful effort to analyze, process, and evaluate data to turn into something usable. And a lot of the time, it's going to turn into nothing even after all that work. It's really easy to learn the wrong lessons from good data, and it's not a reflection of someone being dumb or being unable to understand what's happening. It's a reflection of how complicated this field really is. And there's nothing wrong with turning to an expert if you need someone to help you figure it out. Anyways, I think I've talked your ear off enough for one night, especially considering that you've probably got some holiday stuff to do right about now. But thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and consider becoming a channel member for $5 a month. Each month, my channel members vote for one of the videos I make, and the video you just watched was the one they chose for this month. If you'd like to vote in the January poll, voting is going to be opening on January 1st between two returning topics as well as a few brand new ones. My next video is going to be the top donor donathon topic, which I think will probably end up coming out on January 1st. So, assuming I don't get it done early, I want to make sure I thank you for an amazing 2023 and wish you happy holidays and a safe new year. Thank you to all of my channel members. MiniQ, Oles, Cage the Orc, Fish Toast, Alex Stone, Nemo the Survivor, Destiny, Connor, Yoshi of the Wire, It's Peggy BTW, Cat Lover 192, Sourdough, Aluma Riley, Venus, Monkey 12 Ninja, Cadence, V, and The Leathers. Whether you're a channel member, a subscriber, or you just clicked on this video out of curiosity, thank you very much for watching, and I hope I'll see you around again soon.